Él es el coronel Benny Gantz. Fue jefe del Estado Mayor de las Fuerzas de Defensa Israelíes desde el 2011 hasta el 2015. Mostrando siempre grandes habilidades de liderazgo, Benny ha comandado importantes momentos que han marcado su carrera militar. En 1991, dirigió la Operación Salomón, en la que más de 14.000 judíos etíopes emigraron al Estado de Israel. En el año 2000, mientras se enfrentaba a una guerra con el grupo terrorista Hezbollah en Líbano, Benny fue el último en abandonar las zonas enemigas. Pero su carrera militar es igual de impresionante que su preparación académica. Tiene un título en Historia en la Universidad de Tel Aviv, una maestría en Ciencias Políticas en la Universidad de Haifa y una maestría en Gestión de Recursos por la Universidad Nacional de la Defensa en Estados Unidos. Traído a nuestro país por los amigos de la Universidad de Tel Aviv en México y en entrevista para Enlace Judío, Benny comienza mostrando una fotografía de una mujer delgada que se encuentra en un campo de concentración nazi. Se trata de su madre, quien fue sobreviviente del holocausto. Fuera de entrevista, pero con la cámara encendida, Benny comenta. So let me show you a picture. This is my mother at the day of the liberation of Bergen Belsen. She was 17 years old, 28 kilos. Okay? I have okay. a question. Yeah. See, here I put the two pictures together. This is my mother, mm -hmm. and this is me as the chief of staff, and this is my son who gets for me Ooh. the red braid. So tell me who won. Of course, we won. Y es así como inicia una interesante plática sobre humanidad, política, historia y una muy interesante vida personal. First of all, thank you for your time. Nice to meet you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Welcome to Mexico. Yes, beautiful, by the way. With everything you have had to see as a soldier and commander, what has impressed you the most in a personal way? It's, uh, I guess, a combination. Uh, there are always the professional issues that you need to deal with, how to do something right, how to do something precise, how to do something good. And there's always the emotional piece of it, of the devotion of the people, of the falling of your friends, of your soldiers. So the combination, I think, between professional complexities and personal emotional aspects. I think this is the most uh, interesting things in these 38 years of service. I know that your mother is a Holocaust survivor. Has that fact influenced your role as an officer in any way? Yeah, in many ways. Not in any ways, but in many ways. And I think if I have to come up with, with two messages that I always carried with me, for my discussions with my late parents, and especially with my mother, but also with my father, who was a refugee in Europe throughout the world, that we have to be very strong, and we have to stay human. And this is something that they were talking about all the time, when I was a kid, when I was a grown-up, and especially when I was a general. Uh, I remember that uh, during one of the campaigns we had uh, cast lead in, with Gaza. Uh, my mother kept telling me all the time that we must continue fighting, but we must make sure to send them food. So it was a combination all the time between stay strong, but try to stay as human as you can. And I think that when we talk about those issues, especially when now it's the Holocaust Day, I think it's a very important message for the Jewish people. We have to stay strong. No way for us being weak. We must be strong. But at the very same time, from Jewish tradition, from historical experience, we always must stay human. And I'm very proud for being able to lead the IDF in my times, and I sh I'm sure I know my daddy Eisenkot, the current chief, is doing the same. We always bear in mind that we must stay strong and do what we need to do, professionally speaking, 
but never give up humanity. Benny, your job in the Israeli Defense Forces has allowed you to live up close the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So I want to ask you, do you believe that one day there will be peace between Israelis and Palestinians? I hope so. I know it's a very complicated situation. Israel cannot and should not compromise on any of its security demands. But we should not give up the hope of peace and the struggle of getting there. Uh, I think it's in the hands of the leaders of both sides, the Israeli sides, but on the Palestinian sides as well. They need to give up their own dreams. They need to understand that we are not going anywhere. We need to understand that they are not going anywhere. Uh, we will maintain the security of Israel and the region in our hands, no matter under what kind of political circumstances. And if they want to move forward, they need to start to stop the jihadist approach and to be more realistic. So then I think we may be able to move forward. So to answer it, I'm saying I don't know if we can get there. But I'm telling you we must try and get there. It's both strategic interest, but also a moral message. In each of the confrontations the State of Israel has had with its enemies, the IDF has been accused of using disproportionate force. What do you respond to that? I disagree with that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in those kind of conflicts, and especially because our enemies are using civilian population as human shield, if you have a cellar in your home, you may enjoy it for a wine cellar. But in Gaza, they use the cellars to hide rockets. If I have to protect Israel, I have, if you wish, kind of dilemma between the fact that I need to defend Israel, but when I'm doing something offensively, I might hurt people. So we have done everything in our capacity to alert the civilian, to evacuate the areas, to pre-war issues. We invented techniques, we call it knock on the roof. A small bomb on the roof, make the people leave the house, then explode the house. Militaries have never done that. But I'll tell you more than that. In the last six months of my service, after we finished uh, Protective Edge, uh, a delegation of 25 generals from different militaries in the world came to see what we have done in Gaza and how we operated there. And they say, that we have set a moral standard that they cannot follow. In Hebrew, there is a saying, Let the stranger praise you and not you yourself. So if 25 different generals came, did two weeks investigation, checked what they've checked, understood the complexities because we had to defend our country, same stance. And this is the very same case when we see now we have to defend from Gaza those demonstrations to try to breach the fence. If we wanted to create hundreds of casualties, 30 seconds, it's done. Look at Syria. Assad is butchering his own men with ammunition by and large and with chemical weapons specifically. And we have opened, in my time, a field hospital to get Syrian casualties and treat them. More than 4,000 Syrians were treated in Israeli hospitals and were sent back to Syria. So, morally speaking, I hate to see people getting hurt. But I know that we are doing our best to prevent it. It said that you were the last commander to abandon the Lebanese occupation in the year 2000. Today, in retrospective, what is your opinion about that war in particular? Uh, I've served in Lebanon for 22 years, getting in and out all the time. I started as a young parachutist uh, in Litani operation after a family, of, a family member of mine was kid, uh, killed by terrorists that came from the ocean. And I left Lebanon as a brigadier general in May 2000, the last Israeli soldier to leave Lebanon. Uh, we have zero interest in Lebanon to exclude security. We have no demands of territory, of 
national resources, whatever. The only consideration we have with Lebanon is our security. I also know the Lebanese people themselves. Now, if I put aside politics and I look at the people themselves, I believe that they would like to have normal, regular life with good neighboring with Israel. And I'm telling you, I was there for 22 years. It's something that I can be pretty much sure of. Unfortunately, the dirt of politics and the jihadist activities in Lebanon have changed somewhat the realities there. So Israel is not interfering in Lebanon to exclude monitoring things for our security. And I hope that the government of Lebanon will be responsible enough to make sure that nothing happens to Israel from Lebanon. If that's the case, nothing, happen, nothing will happen to Lebanon from Israel. But uh, we need to remember that in Lebanon there are many Hezbollah activists. And you have so many houses in Lebanon that have missile room and a living room in the same house. When we will come after the missile room, the living room will be unfortunately hit as well. So I hope that they will back off. We never assault Israel, and if that's the case, I think we'll have quite future. But if war will happen, we will have to fight again. What is the greatest challenge today for the IDF? The IDF is a, is a great challenge. Uh, I've, I've, I've once heard from Shimon Peres, who was our president at the time, that sometimes we do things like we fix a watch while it's working. Basically, this is the challenge of the IDF. The IDF needs constantly to protect Israel with its current capabilities, but constantly always prepare for future challenges that are changing all the time. So if you ask me if I have to keep up with one sentence, so how can you always be alert and ready to operate? At the same time, change yourself to future challenges that are not exist yet. So it's a unique combination, but we have very good people very devoted soldiers and commanders from all different sides of the Israeli society. Uh, I think that the, few, the current soldiers and the current commanders of the IDF are as good or better than what we were. Uh, and I'm very confident with the capabilities of defending the country. Benny, thank you very much for your work. Too many years of yeah, work. Yeah, thank you. But I want to take the opportunity to speak about partnership because I think this is very important. The relations between Israel and the Jewish communities in diaspora are crucial for our strategic posture and strength. And the relations, when you come and you visit and you care about and you influence and you study, all this really not just helping the local communities, but it also helps Israel, because we are as strong as the relations we have with our communities. So I encourage the, the community to stay strong as a community, to support each other, and to stay in a very warm and hectic touch with Israel. It's important for us. Yeah, of course. We are very close. Thank you. You're welcome.